we've discussed consciousness and the power of experience a lot. As you talk about a lot in, in at least both of your recent books, uh, Science Delusion or Science Set Free and Science and Spiritual Practices, consciousness is being progressively seen as a problem, the hard problem in um, philosophy of mind. Uh, can you tell us a bit about you know, the recent history of this, of that science and where do you think it's going? Well, it's it's um, a long history, really. Um, I mean, the, 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 in European thought, it's all really goes into European thought and what happened in the Middle Ages and after that. In the Middle Ages in Europe, there was a, a fairly unified philosophy of nature, a holistic view of nature, based on Aristotle and Plato, mainly Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, who Christianized a lot of the Aristotelian thought, based very much on Arabic philosophy. Um, and this gave a view of a living world, living animals and plants as truly alive, the whole earth as truly alive, living nature, and God as relate, a living God relating to living nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. The 17th century revolution in science gave a completely different view of nature. It gave the view of the whole of nature as an automatic machine. God started it in the first place. Um, designed it like an engineer, pressed the start button, and then the whole universe was supposed to have carried on mm. like a machine with no soul, no spirit, and no consciousness, just made of unconscious matter, mechanical. But the founders of modern science in the 17th century, like Newton and Descartes and Robert Boyle and Kepler and Galileo, were not atheists, they were, they were Christians. Uh, but they had a very dualistic view of God separated from nature. So there were two realms, nature made of unconscious matter and the world of spirit, which was not material, not in space and time, and contained three elements, God, angels, and spirits, and human minds. Mm -hmm. And human minds were the only thing in the physical, natural world which were not mechanical, material, and unconscious. Yeah. So this, as you know, is usually called Cartesian dualism after Descartes. Um, and that uh, led to a sort of reasonable mode of coexistence between science and religion. People could go on being scientists and take, talking about mechanical nature. They could go on being religious. The only thing is you couldn't really cross from one compartment there's, to another very there's easily. Not, there's there's non-overlapping magisteria. That's right. It was two separated realms and people could be perfectly conventional scientists on weekdays and Christians <laughs> or Jew on Sundays or Jews on Saturdays yeah. um, and uh, lead separate kinds of lives. And uh, basically, this split has been exported from Europe to the rest of the world. When I lived in India, I worked as a scientist in a scientific institute. My colleagues were mainly Hindus and Muslims, a few Sikhs and Parsis. But basically, they'd learned the rules of the game. When you're at work, you don't challenge the mechanistic view of nature. You just go along with it, conventional scientists. As soon as they left work, they became pretty conventional Muslims or Hindus or mm. Sikhs or whatever. Um, and they lived in two worlds, two compartments. Well, anyway, in the 19th century in Europe, uh, an increasing number of people said, we don't want two realities, we just want one. Um, one is more true than two. Um, and so they said, uh, some of them said, well, there's only spirit. Instead of spirit and matter, we just have spirit. And that was the idealist philosophy, only consciousness is real. Matter's kind of done, done mind. And that was surprisingly common in 19th century Europe, particularly in Germany. Um, but the other school said, no, forget about spirit. You can't measure it, you can't see it, you can't weigh it. Uh, it just doesn't exist. There's no such thing as God and angels. There's just human consciousness. And that's basically not very different from animal consciousness. And it's just a matter of the brain. So. At one stroke, they got rid of God and angels. And the main reason in the 19th century for people signing up to this materialist, uh, atheist view was political. In France and in Russia particularly, the governments there claimed that their authority rested on uh, God, on the church, on religion. Um, and they were oppressive autocratic regimes. 
So the revolutionaries, the communists and the socialists, thought the best way to undermine the power and authority of the government was to say, well, God doesn't exist. So strike at the root. Does strike at the root. Then there's no authority whatever for mm. these authoritarian monarchies um, in Russia, the Tsar, and in France, the authoritarian regime uh, in the 18th century of, of the king. And then when there were various reactionary regimes after that, they were pro-Catholic, so they struck at the root. Mm. Um, in Protestant countries, it wasn't such an extreme separation because the, the Protestants and the Catholics had already thrashed out their religious divisions and there was an alternative to a monolithic state with a single uh, religious power that supported mm. the authorities. There were already a range of different churches and a range of different ways of being religious, but it was in France and Russia that the communists became most powerful and they were atheistic. Mm. So anyway, this then spread through Europe as the materialist philosophy gained hold and it became adopted by scientists increasingly uh, because it meant scientists could say they were the new priesthood, they were the new source of authority. Forget about religion. If we live in this kind of materialist world, the people who really know what's going on and who are the real authorities are the scientists. And by the late 19th century, um, materialism had become the official orthodoxy of science, or maybe unofficial orthodoxy, but at any rate, the orthodoxy. And it worked quite well in physics and chemistry. Um, it's never worked terribly well in biology um, because it's never fully explained biological development. Uh, the idea that evolution's just chance and blind forces is not persuasive to a lot of people. Um, and above all, it leads to this problem from which we started, namely consciousness. Because if the world's made of unconscious matter, and that's the primary reality, indeed the only ultimate reality, then how come we're conscious? We ought not to be. Mm. Um, and so philosophers of mind, materialist philosophers of mind, have to pretend that we're not conscious. Either we're not conscious or our consciousness does nothing. It's just like a shadow, mm. um, doesn't do anything. It's an, uh, like a kind of epiphenomenon of the activity of the nervous system um, or just another way of talking about physical processes. But it doesn't do anything. It can't just interfere with physical causation. Mm. And um, it also means we have no free will. So incredibly, this is what large numbers of intellectuals persuade themselves must be true mm. and try to persuade others that it must be true. Uh, even though if we have no free will, it's hard to see how we could be persuaded of anything. Thanks for watching this clip of Rupert Sheldrake talking about the history of materialism. Check out our other clips from him or watch our full interview. We've got loads more content on these topics here at Rational Religion, so make sure you have a browse and subscribe.